Good morning, field biology. Um, today we will talk through part two of the insect orders. So hopefully you've completed part one. If you have not, make sure you do that. Make sure you fill out the Google form called insect orders part one. All right, so on to part two. Um, the first group we will talk about today is more than likely one that you have caught examples for for your collection and that is the bee ant and wasp group and you may not have realized that ants actually are very closely related to bees and wasps in fact the uh, theory of um ants is that it was a uh, wingless or a wasp that went underground and um lost its wings so you can see a similarity in body shape that should be a clue to you or be a reminder to you of their close relationship so the name hymenoptera basically translates to remembering that terra means wing translates to membranous wing okay so the wings that these guys have are going to be uh, membranous transparent uh, lightweight basically made for flight so uh, the layout of their wings though is a little bit different from some of the other insects a lot of insects have wings that are two pairs of wings that are similar sizes uh, in the bees ants and wasps they contain very large fore wings and the hind wings are much smaller so maybe you'll be able to see that in our lab looking through microscopes things that you can maybe not recognize as much in real life as you can in a lab setting. Mouth parts, um, chewing and sucking type mouth parts, depending on the way they live, you know, just simply in the, in the uh, bee category or the ant category, we have many different kinds of um, ways they feed and things that they, target for food sources and that will dictate what kind of mouth parts they would have we might find them on plants might find them in the ground gathering nectar which in turn makes them some of the greatest pollinators that we have you can see a honeybee down here on a flower it will pick up pollen and transfer that to another flower the young of Hymenoptera are maggot-like um, larva. Maybe you have seen ants carrying eggs or moving things from one area to another. Uh, maybe you've seen larval wasps or bees in a nest that has fallen down or that you've taken off your property. Um, but the reality is that many of these in this group, not all of them, but many of them are social insects. So we see a a complex grouping or a complex uh, hive structure or nest structure where we have queens and basically every insect will have a uh, a job and that can be problematic for us if you encounter their uh, their place they live I guess their nest or their hive because um, they will protect it and that social um, structure very much like a human social structure uh, they will defend themselves and they will uh, become aggressive to to protect basically the livelihood of their of their of their structure they uh they kind of kind of they kind of act as one super organism in a way bees honeybees are often considered a super organism because of that connection between every individual insect in the hive all right do you have a bee or do you have a wasp that's uh probably one of the things that kids initially make a mistake of when we start this project and, and it's fine uh, but hopefully as you um, complete more of the work here in field biology, you'll realize that, you know, there is a huge difference. So let's look at bees versus wasps. Initially, you'll see yellow and black. 
and they fly around and they buzz and people probably are more concerned with getting away from the animal than they are looking at it. So if we look at bees and wasps, um, the first thing we notice is that their body is externally is a little bit different. Uh, bees are fuzzy, wasps barely any, well, less fuzzy, let's say. They do have some hairs. Bees help humans by pollinating plants. Wasps actually help us too by eating other insects. So that's one of the key thing is, our key things is um, wasps are meat eaters, basically. They're carnivorous, okay? Where bees tend to be more of like a herb herb herbivore animal. So what they eat, bees eat pollen and nectar. Wasps eat human food that is laying around. Okay. Um, and that's true, but they can also eat, uh, you know, non-human food that's laying around. Um, a dead squirrel, for instance, or frog or something. Um, bees generally are gentle, rarely sting unless they're provoked or, or uh, threatened where it seems like wasps are a little more, um, let's say less patient, I guess, and uh, aggressive and ready to sting quicker. And how they hold their legs is different too. Bees, the legs are usually hidden when they fly, where wasps often you'll see the legs hang, hanging down. And it's kind of a, oh, kind of a creepy thing to uh, to, to witness. If you've seen that, it's, it's a little weird to see those long legs hanging. All right, here is a, uh, once again, this is from the uh, zoo in Omaha, Nebraska. And we've got a selection of hymenopterans, membranous winged insects. Um, so you can see up in the upper right, there's some ants, We've got bees, we've got the, the Vespid wasps, the Echnumen wasps, which have these long tails. Sometimes their tails are many times longer than their body. Um, the Pelicinid wasps, horn tails, which a couple people have captured so far this year. Um, and then some other, other ones that I may not know as well um, that we don't have maybe as commonly in this area or at all. Okay, our next group is diptera. Diptera are the flies and the mosquitoes. And in science, di means two. Di stands for two. Maybe you've seen that in, if you've taken chemistry, dihydrogen would mean two hydrogen atoms. So the reason flies and mosquitoes get this name is they only have one pair of wings. So most insects have two pairs. Flies and mosquitoes only have one. And that's really a key thing. If you have a insect that you can't tell, is it a fly? Is it a bee? There's many flies that are colored like bees and there's some bees that are not as colorful as you'd expect. So you got to check the total, total number of wings will tell you. Flies have a piercing or sucking or rasping mouth part. Um, there's a big variety of flies and mosquitoes, but we can see a mosquito down here getting its blood meal. Um, that would be the piercing sucking type mouth. Um, house flies like we see here contain what's called a rasping mouth. And the way they feed is they need to liquefy their meal. So they kind of grind it up into a, into a, liquid form and basically drink it up that way. Uh, the disgusting thing is that often, well, what they have to do is they have to regurgitate their, what they're trying to eat to get it to liquefy. And so often you'll get what they eat before on the substance that they're currently eating. So if a fly is on your piece of pizza and before it was on a, you know, a um, dead animal or something. You can see what's going on here. We're getting, uh, we're getting transfer of 
some of those previous things that it had been eating. Um, and whether that's a plant, an animal, decaying material, you know, flies and mosquitoes are, uh, can be found on all of these, depending on what type they are. And so we, we, uh, tend to shoo them away from our food for obvious reasons. Um, they're vectors for disease. They basically can carry different, uh, diseases. You guys are probably familiar with malaria or West Nile virus, um, carried by mosquitoes. Some are even parasitic drinking the blood of others. Mosquitoes do that. Horse flies do that. So these guys kind of get a bad rap in the insect world. Probably the most commonly uh, despised and looked down upon insects. The young of these are maggots. So we can see a group of maggots here. You've probably all seen that. If you've come across anything decaying, whether that's a, an animal or even decaying plant material, grass clippings, things like that, you can you can often find maggots there. Okay. Should be able to see six little legs there, but I don't think you guys want to look at maggot pictures for too long. Lepidoptera, probably one of the hardest ones for kids to pronounce. Okay, just takes practice. Lepidoptera, so make sure you practice that. The butterflies and moths. And lepido in Greek transfers to scales. Okay, now we're not talking about scales for weighing. We're talking about scales similar to what a fish would have on it. Okay, so if we see this magnified picture, this is actually a close-up view of a butterfly or moth wing. So all of this color on their wings is actually made of little overlapping plates, very much like the shingles on your roof. Okay, and that's where the name comes from. Now, in terms of s differentiating butterflies and moths, uh, all you need to do is, well, I shouldn't say all you need to do, but one of the clues is uh, the wings. And so butterflies often will hold their wings up in the air when they're at rest or out, and often will get a tracing of those wings. And notice what letter I'm making. A B, right? B for butterfly. Moths oftentimes will hold their wings over their body flat. Watch this. I've got an M, right? M for moth. So that's one clue. And there are exceptions to this, of course. But uh, when are they active? Generally speaking, butterflies are active during the day. Moths active at night. But there are some exceptions. But if you follow that, rule of thumb, you're, you'll usually be pretty close or accurate. Uh, mouth parts are called siphoning, very much like a, like a garden hose or a big bendy straw. So they can unroll that mouthpiece to get to uh, nectar and flowers. And the young, of course, are caterpillars. So don't overlook that. Uh, caterpillars can be in your collection. Probably one of the most interesting insect transformations going from a caterpillar to a butterfly or a moth. All right, so here's just some comparisons. I've got a couple of slides that show this. Butterflies and moths. Uh, Color-wise, generally, butterflies are brighter. Moths usually duller. Um, the body has a difference. We see a thinner body typically in most butterflies than we do moths. Thinner body. When they're active can be an indicator. Butterflies are usually active and during the day. Moths more so at night. Um, how they hold their wings. Butterflies, their wings rest together upright. Where moths, they hold them at their sides. The antenna can look different. Butterflies tend to have straight, smooth antenna with bulbs on the end. See these little uh, larger flaring out at the end where moths will have feathered and fuzzy antenna, sometimes looking maybe more so like a, a, f uh, a bird feather or something. 
Butterflies, by definition, will create a chrysalis for their metamorphosis. Moths, a, co a cocoon in their stage. So slightly different structure um, for, I guess, for our understanding as a human. To us, it seems probably very similar. And both our insects have six legs. Both, of course, start as an egg, hatch into a larva or a caterpillar, and both have three body sections. So that just verifies that they're both insects. All right, I took this uh, display. This was in the Omaha Zoo, and um, I thought it was, you know, a nice way to back it up here. Um, but we see basically the same, the same uh, descriptions here. So feel free to pause the video and look at those. Here was a, um, a display at the Omaha Zoo of many different varieties in butterfly colors, sizes, proportions. Um, and there's some moths thrown in there too, butterflies and moths here. But we probably don't see this much variety. And I'm not sure if these are worldwide butterflies or just North American. I'm not quite sure. So they just had this and I thought it looked, looked very, uh, that was pretty. So I took a picture of it. They also had this display where we have, uh, various butterflies hanging, but you can also see there's some other things hanging, isn't there? We've got cocoons and chrysalises. And this was basically a hatching, um, a hatching cage, I guess, if you could call it that. Um, so they're hatching out um, butterflies for their indoor butterfly exhibit. There's uh, Jackson and Jackson, my daughter, Jaina, and then my niece looking at the, uh, checking them out there. Pretty cool. All right. And then we have the group called Odonata. This is our dragonflies and our damselflies. And this is the one that we're learning that's just a little bit different. The name's a little different. Notice there is no Terra at the end. So they are named not for their wings, but for their ability to chew. Okay, their um, durable and sturdy mouth structure. And so the name translates to toothed. All right. So if you think about um, going to the dentist or the orthodontist, uh, remember ortho means straighten. So what does the orthodontist straighten? Your teeth. So anytime we see this base, we remember that refers to teeth. Okay. Dentist, dentist, dental, things like that. Um, I remember it totally a different way. I remember it because I have an uncle named Don who actually um, doesn't have any of his teeth because of uh, various life choices he's made in terms of um, nutrition and stuff. So uh, that's how I remember it. Um, it's kind of one of his, one of his main. Uh, I shouldn't say main, but just one of his, one of his features. The uh, dragonflies have two pairs of wings and these are um, right now anyways, regarded as one of the most efficient predators, if not the most efficient predator on earth. Uh, they have a 95% success rate in, in their kills. So dragonflies, we know will eat mosquitoes and other insects and uh, rarely ever miss what they're going after. So they're pretty, um, pretty cool. They're kind of like the fighter pilots of the insect world. Uh, in terms of separating them or differentiating them, dragonflies are bigger. They hold their wings out. Okay, I always think, of, you know, a dragon in a cartoon or a children's story you know, they're the, they're the beast, right? They're, they're big and they're powerful and they promote fear where 
the damselfly is more dainty, a little slender body, more slender, and they hold their wings up in the air. Okay, so damselfly's wings are always up. And what is a damsel? If you think about like children's stories or um, books you used to read as a kid, a damsel is a female, the damsel in distress, right? The female in distress. The dragon is the one that's causing the problems, right? So we have a damsel um, captured by a dragon and someone has to come in and save her. So if you think about those stories that we've always grew up with, uh, it helps you to, to remember, you know, which one's, which one's uh, skinnier and smaller and daintier? The female, right? The girl, the, the girl human, where the dragon is the big, scary, large creature. Um, these have chewing mouth parts, and they're found near fresh water. They lay their eggs underwater. And uh, the whole um, life cycle of a dragonfly is pretty neat how they develop in water and eventually come out onto land and uh, molt. All right, so that is the rest of our insect orders. So you had four in part one, four in part two. Please go fill out Google form called insect orders part two. And uh, once everyone has had ample time to get those things done, we'll talk about when we'll have a quiz. So, all right. Thanks for watching and keep collecting. Bye.